All right, well, both of you have already been introduced since you have uh, been speaking today already. Just briefly, I'll say my name is Neil Locke. Uh, I'm a Presbyterian minister in El Paso, Texas, and I am thrilled to be here right now. I have so many questions, and even a few of them are about aging and, and all of that. But, um, <clears throat> okay, well, you're just one, just one. Uh, do you use any kind of beard oil or beard balm <laughs> or... No, I don't, actually. Um, no, I mean, I... Um, I comb? Started, a comb? <laughs> occasionally. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I started growing a beard when I was 32, which is, let me see, 23 years ago. Um, and that was after five years of campaigning by my ex-wife, who, um, you know, was a real beard fanatic and really wanted me to. I really didn't want to. I thought it would be horrible and gunky. Uh, and, uh, but it turned out to be no maintenance. I don't need to wash it with anything unusual, just with soap and... You know, I don't do anything clever with it, and it's um, it, it just grew out like this. I was rather surprised myself. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it it grew from nothing to this long in two years flat, um, and uh, since then, you know, it doesn't grow anymore. I don't trim it or anything. It just like it's like eyebrows or some kind of genetically imposed equilibrium. I I know that very well. This is about two years too, okay. <laughs> sadly. <clears throat> All right. I have, I have a funny feeling that you may be prejudicial. In other words, you may be trimming it. Here. <laughs> trimming it is, is, a, is not recommended if you want to grow it. Okay, all right, all right. So noted. Okay, I'm, I'm going to jump in with... Uh, uh-oh, did we lose battery? Okay. I'm going to start here with a story slash joke. Really, it's more of a story because it's not funny as a joke. Uh, but it's a story, it's a tired old story that you have probably all heard some pastor at some point tell, but what you may not have heard it is in the context of transhumanism, and so I wanted you to think of this old story in that way, and then I've got a question about it for each one of you, uh, and the story is this one. Um, there's a man who's up on his roof because the flood waters have been rising up, and uh, he prays to God to help him, uh, to save him from the flood. And so along comes a big truck plowing through the water, and the driver says, get in. And he says, no, 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 no. I have faith in God. God will save me. I prayed to God. And so the truck drives on. Next comes a boat, and the boat driver says, get in. You're about to drown. And he says, no, no, no. I prayed to God, and I have faith. God will save me. Go on. Next, the helicopter comes. Same thing. Flood waters rise. Man dies. So when he reaches heaven, he says to God, I had such great faith. I thought you were going to save me. How come you didn't save me? And God says to the man, I sent you a boat. I sent you a truck. I sent you a helicopter. Work with me. All right. <laughs> and so my question, um, and I'll, I'll, I'm just going to throw it out there, and you can each answer it. But my question to Micah why is it that Christians get so angry when we talk about eternal life without using the framework of God? And my question to Aubrey is why, in, in your experience, do you think it is that people outside of the Christian community, maybe specifically in the scientific community, certainly in the transhumanist community, get so angry when we talk about life extension and ending aging and things like that, but we use God as our motivating factor and frame. Whoever wants to can tackle it first. Uh, okay, so yeah, I think um, what, what that gets to is the, the question of uh, are we eliminating the need for God, right? This is a, a thing that I've heard from, from different Christians who are concerned about what things we might create that then eliminate the need for God. And I think from a Christian theological standpoint, that's a really weird idea, right? Because presumably God is already here and working in the world. We can't eliminate the need for God because presumably if, that's, if God exists, then we would just all stop existing, right? So I think what that's actually talking about, what people actually mean, is that it's a marketing problem. Like if we, if we create a world that is better significantly than the world we live in, then what are we going to use to sell people on religion, right? 
And um, and I think that's so that I think is why it's such a challenging thing. We don't want to take away our marketing, um, you know, message. <laughs> And um, and I think I think that comes from a fundamental mistake because we're we're trying to sell people with fear rather than with faith. We're trying to sell people with fear rather than with hope. We're trying to sell people with fear rather than a vision of a mission that we could perform in the world. Um, and what I think is interesting about um, what Aubrey's described is, um, as he's described it, he's motivated not by uh, a fear of dying personally, but by a desire to do something to relieve suffering and to make the world better. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mike. I think that was really well said. I, I, of course, you're right about me. I, you know, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not planning on dying, but it's not what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, and yeah, marketing, totally. I mean, look what happened when Darwin came along. You know, fuck. I mean, the fact is, you know, when a... You know, Aquinas had five reasons why God exists, and four of them were obviously complete bullshit. You know, they were like, you know, just playing with words. And then there was this thing called the argument from design, which obviously made a lot of sense. And, um, you know, when Darwin came along, suddenly there wasn't an argument from design anymore, more or less. But, hello, here's religion, perfectly healthily keeping going. The Christian church is not all that much smaller than it was back then. You know, say, so we don't need this. You know, it's bullshit. Um, um, so you're completely right. Um, but to answer your question, you know, why, um, actually, give me your question again. Why do people outside of the Christian community, for example, in the scientific community, in the transhumanist uh, community, tend to yeah. get so upset well, when we talk about the same things, but we use God as our frame of I reference? I think the fundamental reason is because when you guys talk about it, it sounds as though you're saying something hypocritical. It sounds as though you're saying that suffering doesn't matter because it's you know, a finite in duration, and eventually you all get to heaven, and that's all, you know, I think, something wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, which is completely contrary to what Scripture tells you to think, right? So, um, so that makes no sense. So scientists are basically saying, well, look, fuck, um, you know, we don't want suffering either. We're just honest about it. Mm -hmm. And you guys just grow up, really. That's, I think, the main thing. <laughs> Which, which I'd have to say probably is not helpful of an attitude on either side. Well, I mean, yeah. yes and no. I mean, essentially, I'm just saying the same thing. I'm st I'm, this is the advice that I'm giving you guys here to take out to your community and your churches and so on, is to say, you know, be intellectually honest about this. Remember that suffering is something you're supposed to be minimizing. Remember that whether God made it that way or not, the fact is aging causes suffering. And therefore, we damn well ought to fix it. And if God wants to strike us down with a thunderbolt at the age of 120, regardless, then so be it. We're not opposing that. We're just opposing the suffering that goes first. You know, so it's just an important matter of intellectual honesty. And I, I believe that that's really all that secular scientists are really saying, even though they may not say it in words that come across very well to religious people. And, and I think I would also say that a lot of people in the Christian community sometimes don't express to the best of our ability uh, our, our theology and our ideas the way we, we should. I did take a picture before I came out here. This is a, a hospital in my city that was um, the, the kind of product of the generosity of a, a man named Sam Young, who was a member of my church, and the epitaph, or the, I guess the quote on the bottom of it is, servant of God in the age-long exalted mission of alleviating human suffering and extending human life. There you go. And that was in, you know, 1980-something before any of this really... Was uh, he a biologist? No, he was actually a banker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was his yeah. mission, and... and uh, uh, I want to say something else about, too, because you both mentioned the, the difference between hope and fear, right? Um, but I think they're both pretty powerful motivating forces, and so maybe if fear has worked for Christianity in, in some sense, um, do you not also benefit from the man or woman who wakes up in the morning afraid of dying right. and happens to have a billion dollars? I so wish. I so <laughs> wish. So, of course, you're absolutely right. Fear really works. And it's not just in religion. You know, fear is the way, and, you know, 
anger and all those negative stuff, you know, seven deadly sins, they work quite well, really, as motivators. But that is precisely the problem that I was describing. We have had, millen we have had since the dawn of civilization to figure out how not to be intimidated by aging, to figure out how to trick ourselves into this thing that I often call the pro-aging trance. Um, this, this frame of mind where we think that aging is some kind of blessing in disguise and we shouldn't mess with it. Um, and even if we could mess with it, you know, um, bad things would happen. So, yeah, I mean, you can't create fear against something that people have already made their peace with. Right. Um, you know, either you somehow do an end run around that and make them understand that actually what you're fighting is something they already have decided they want to fight. And that is a large part of why I make so much of emphasis about this lack of a biological distinction between column three and column four, between the so-called diseases of old age and aging itself. Um, because people are already perfectly happy with the idea that Alzheimer's is a bad thing and we'd like to fix it. You know, if we could get that concept, that frame of mind, to be broadened to cover the, everything that goes wrong with our health in old age, we'd be done. I suppose we should get to the question that's on the big screen here. Um, and, and so I'm just going to straight up with that one. Uh, should we uh, live to be 500 and adding a layer to that, uh, would you like to live to be 500? So I've got a well-publicized answer to this, but I'll wait. I'll let Micah answer right. it first. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, so, should we live to be 500? Would I like to be? Would I like to live to be 500? Um, yeah. So there are a lot of, of qualifications that that people would love to drop on this for good reason, um, because it's at what expense or at what cost, right? And and then a lot of people would ask the question, well, what kind of life are we experiencing? But I think what Aubrey is suggesting is that we can extend our healthy, productive, relational life. Right, the life that we really are able to contribute meaningfully to the world around us. And when we're talking about that kind of life, then I think, yes, we should have more of that. And I'll take 500 years of it, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, people give the most spectacular reasons why they wouldn't want to live to 500 or 1,000 or whatever. They'll say, oh, all my, all my old friends will be gone. You know, <laughs> who told you that you were the only person who was gonna, I mean. <laughs> Was that part of the question? I mean, Jesus wept. Um, I, I, um, but, um, but, but it's worse than that. I mean, I mean, it's such a dumb question. In the, I mean, it, however you phrase. So I like to compare it with the, with the other, the following question: What time would you like to go to the toilet next Friday? All right. Now, well, you may be thinking, why is that the same kind of question? The answer is because you already know that that's a dumb question, and you know why it's a dumb question. Now, note that I did not say, what time do you expect to go to the toilet? You may have an opinion about that, because, you know, habit. But <laughs> the fact is, what time you want to go to the toilet is a completely absurd thing to have an opinion about. Information on the topic, nearer the time. <laughs> and you're going to be able to act on that information. I mean, I haven't the faintest clue whether I want to live to 100. But I have no reason to think that I need to know why, whether I want to live to 100. I want to be able to make that choice when I'm bloody 99, you know, <laughs> and not have that choice progressively removed from me by my declining health. You know, how obvious is that? Jesus. <laughs> I shouldn't be saying Jesus quite so often. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. uh, you know, I was going to answer the question, but uh, after that... Um, no, I'll still answer the question. I, I, I will answer the question in the, in the service of what you talked about earlier, advocacy. Because I think, I find, at least in my congregation, in my community, if you want us to advocate for these things, we have to be able to paint a picture and inspire the imagination. That's something Derek Webb talked about, you know, what art does. Yep, and, yep. and I think that that's what advocacy also does. And, uh, and so one of the things that inspires me is, um, has anyone ever used the uh, um, Evite? You remember Evite, yeah. right? Yeah. Would you believe it's almost 20 years old now? <laughs> That's what I yeah. So um, when I discovered that Evite lets you invite someone to something in the future, 
um, I decided to test how far out that could go. And so all the way back in 2012, um, I created an event for Neil's 200th birthday party. Saturday, May 27th, 2175 at 12 p.m., hosted at a location to be determined when that becomes relevant. Um, <laughs> For what it's worth, the people who responded, and I was a little bit surprised by people who were angry that I even posted that, um, but Lincoln Cannon is going. <laughs> Micah Redding said, looking forward to it. <laughs> Micah only RSVP'd for himself. Lincoln RSVP'd for himself and a guest, I, oh, I guess. Oh, oh no. <laughs> but this is the one well, the that- The guest was not named, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. This is the one that really got me, um, and it's a little bit further down. There was a, a lady named Phyllis Tickle, um, who was the uh, was one of my favorite theologians. She's the editor, was the editor of uh, Publishers Weekly's religion section for quite a while. And uh, on March 22, 2012, Phyllis Tickle said, "Surely will Neil, and blessings on all our souls between now and then, assuming there is still a now and or a then as relevant dimensions." Love it. Uh, and and so I saw Phyllis not too long after that, and before she passed away uh, a little over a year ago, and I essentially asked her this question. She knew about transhumanism, and she knew that someday this today was going to happen too, and uh, she answered that very graciously and kindly, and she answered it affirmatively, and she said, yes, yeah, I would love to, to be at your 200th birthday party. And, uh, and so that's something that inspires me in this work, is yeah. that, you know, and whether it's, whether it's a resurrected kind of thing, a la cryonics or something else, um, or whether it's an extension, either way, I, I think that the relationships are what make Something like that. Word. Yeah, very well said, Neil. Um, I mean, I, I actually want to um, emphasize what you said at the beginning of that, namely the importance of presenting a vision. You're completely correct about that. The question is, what vision? And I believe that this is one of those very clear cases where we should not be emphasizing how long ago people were born. We should be talking about the state they're in. The vision should be one in which there are no sick people at all. Everybody's healthy. Everybody's truly healthy. Everybody can keep up with each other on the dance floor, irrespective of the difference in how long ago they were born. Right. That is the vision that we want to be putting out there. All about health, not about how long ago you were born. I talk, you know, I'm, I, have, I have a variety of little anecdotal, you know, ways to ridicule the idea of these kinds of questions. You know, I say things like, take yourself back to the first time you had sex and ask yourself, what were you thinking immediately beforehand? In particular, were you thinking, oh my God, oh my God, I must get this person into bed right now because I've only got another 60 years to live? <laughs> you know, probably not. Um, you know, we don't make decisions on the basis of how long ago we were born or how long, how long we think we're going to live, except when those numbers are small. You know, if we believe that we are quite soon going to start to be unable to you know, make an honest income because we're too sick, then we do something about that. But if we don't, it's not a matter of loss of urgency. You know, we, our urgency determ is determined by things like, you know, self-esteem and self-image and peer pressure and so on. And that's nothing to do with time. So what can we, uh, and the assumption here when I say we, and I know this may not include everyone in this room, but those of us who are on board in it the- Bloody better include everyone in this room. <laughs> in, the, uh, in the Christian transhumanist community at least, what can we do in our congregations, in our communities uh, to advance the work that you're doing? And, and Micah, that, this is also a question for yeah, you. Yeah, I think I've pretty much said everything I want to say about that. So Micah, go ahead. Uh, so uh, this might be a little bit of a pushback against um, uh, something you just said, um, but I want to talk about that vision, um, and I, I think it's interesting that Scripture gives us a number of visions about what the human future should look like, um, and it's kind of these, these incredibly imaginative, evocative visions, and so they do involve numbers but they only involve them kind of peripherally. And so one of my uh, most, 
one of the passages I find most compelling is Isaiah 65, 20, where Isaiah looks forward to a future in which no one dies in infancy, and the person who dies at 100 will be thought a mere child. And this is an idea, um, in it, the whole passage is about peace on earth and so forth. It's a comprehensive vision of health and life and peace and productivity, right? And the fact that we, that we blow past 100 without even noticing it is part of that thing only because we are on the way to um, just more and more, more uh, relational life. So that's the picture you would paint, I guess, in answer to the, you know, what can we do? What do we do in our communities? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we have to in in the Christian uh, faith, we um, we have a, a Messiah who was crucified at 33. And um, and so we have this, but we also have these other visions of incredibly long life. And so we have to kind of keep these in context with each so, other. So, so wait, Michael, I didn't know that yeah. thing from Isaiah, but I have a question that arises from that. So. I know that there are different interpretations favored by different brands of Christianity with regard to the 120-year so-called limit you know, thing from Genesis, but how do people who believe that you know, that 120-year limit is real reconcile that part of Genesis with the other quote in your experience? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, maybe Neil has, has a yeah. more in-depth thought on that. Um, you're asking the larger question of how do people who take the Bible seriously reconcile different, the bits of it. different parts of the Bible um, that, that are sometimes apparently contradictory yes, and, and entire streams of theology and denominations <laughs> arise from how you answer that question. But I think the important thing is you take it seriously. Um, and, and, and sometimes that means literally Sometimes it means metaphorically, depending on what your tradition is. Um, and sometimes maybe you ask, where does it come from? We have reached from? Revelation. We have reached the end of time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> Speaking of, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I would say, uh, I, w I would just add to that, that um, we, uh, in, the, in the biblical story, we have uh, people who live for hundreds of, um, almost thousands of years, and then we have uh, this decreasing lifespan, and we have this verse about 120 years. We don't know exactly what that means. Some people would say they know what it means, but and then we have a vision of extending life back again. So the question is, you know, whether or not we face a 120-year limit at one point in time, eventually, in the Christian vision, that goes away okay. through God's redemptive work. And so we have to think about what that means and what that looks like. You could take a scientific approach. If you have two studies that seem to have contradicting results, you do a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. And I think if you look at the overarching pattern of the scriptural witness, you sometimes will see which one is the outlier. Uh, and maybe that's the one you need to rethink. We gotta move. Yeah, we, we need to move on. So thank you to Aubrey. Yeah. Thank you to Micah.